Well, it's that time of year again. Happy Chinggis Khan Day. Uh, a year ago, I made a video on Chinggis Khan Day talking about a certain aspect of Chinggis Khan's life. And some of the comments on that video were incredulous that there is such a holiday that, you know, how, why, you know, why would there be such a holiday as Chinggis Khan Day, which is a national holiday in Mongolia. But, you know, people in the West, and I think people also pretty much everywhere except for Mongolia, think of Chinggis Khan as a brutal conqueror. And so it's a little counterintuitive that there would be a holiday for him. So in this video, I'm going to talk about why. Why does Mongolia have a holiday honoring Chinggis Khan? Let me start by giving you a quick summary of Mongolian history. Back in the 1100s, the Mongols were divided up into lots of little tribes, and they would have feuds with each other. And then at the beginning of the 1200s, Chinggis Khan united the tribes and then led them on a series of military campaigns in which they attacked northern China and attacked Central Asia. And then after he died, leadership of the Mongols passed to his sons and then his grandsons, and they continued to expand the Mongol Empire. And this is the part of Mongol history that is best known to people outside of Mongolia. The Mongol Empire broke apart into four pieces. Then in the course of the 1300s, early 1400s, these four pieces all collapsed and ceased to exist. And that was the end of the Mongol Empire. In China, in 1368, a rebellion of Han Chinese drove out the Mongols and established the Ming Dynasty. And then the Mongols continued on within Mongolia, first as a continuation of the Yuan Dynasty of the Mongol regime that had ruled China that continued in a smaller form in Mongolia, but gradually the Chinggisid royal family, the, the lineage descended from Chinggis Khan, gradually lost effective power over the other tribes, and Mongolia ceased to be a united country again. Then in the 1600s, the Manchus from Manchuria conquered Mongolia around the same time that they conquered China. And they created a new empire under their rule, which is referred to as the Qing dynasty in China. So Mongolia, the Mongol tribes were part of the Qing empire. Then in 1911, the Qing dynasty was overthrown in a revolution in China. And then an effort within Mongolia began to establish an independent Mongolian state, which continued for a decade. And then in 1921, Mongolia succeeded in achieving its independence with Soviet help. And they created a communist country. In Mongolia. And the communist regime ruled Mongolia from 1921 to 1990. And during the communist period, Chinggis Khan was not regarded as a national hero. Adulation of Chinggis Khan was very much disapproved of by the government for mainly ideological reasons. Uh, he was seen as a feudal exploiter. Uh, you know, he had been one of the upper class in feudalism, exploiting the common people. And so he's one of the bad guys as far as communism is concerned. And then also communism was internationalist in orientation. Communism typically um, kind of de-emphasizes the nation state and says that that's not really what's important. What's important is all the workers of the world working together. And so holding up someone as a, as a national hero is not to be done. Uh, you can hold someone up as a communist hero, as a hero of communism, because they're a hero of the working class in general. Also, there may have been an element of just Russian influence here. The, the Soviet Union was very dominant in Mongolia during the period of socialism. And the Soviet Union, Soviets in general, Russians in general, had a very negative view and, and still have a very negative view of Chinggis Khan. They see him as a very destructive force. The Mongol Empire is supposed to have held Russia back. And so they told the Mongolians not to hold up Chinggis Khan as a hero. So from the 1950s, which is really when kind of the official line of de-emphasizing Chinggis Khan really came into force, from the 1950s up through the 1980s, all official history in Mongolia, any book that was published on Mongolian history, any textbook, any high school, university lecture, did not talk about Genghis Khan very much. To the extent it did talk about Genghis Khan, it talked about him in very negative terms. But still, a lot of Mongols privately considered Genghis Khan a pretty cool guy because he was a Mongol and so on. 
So then after 1990, when multi-party democracy was established, there was a rejection of socialism and everything associated with socialism, including the official historical narratives that the socialist regime had promoted. And there was a lot of interest among uh, the general public in learning more about Mongols, Mongolia's history. And a, a bunch of new books were published, a lot of books about Genghis Khan or talking about Mongolian history and then actually emphasizing Genghis Khan's role in Mongolian history. And, uh, you know, partly this was just a rejection of socialism's rejection of Genghis Khan. So it's a way of rejecting socialism by you know, bringing back this hero that had been rejected by the socialist government. Partly it was a way of, you know, kind of reformulating what it means to be a Mongolian. Since Mongolia as a, as a communist state de-emphasized the ethnicity of Mongol, Mongols, you know, being a Mongol is not what's important, you know. Um, and, and then this new, you know, in the 1990s, there was this resurgence of nationalist feeling of embracing of Mongol heritage. Uh, so for those reasons, Genghis Khan became very popular again. And he was now seen as a key figure in Mongolian history. But the way Mongolian history was represented in these new books being published in the 1990s, was not the same as the way Mongolian history is presented in books in the West. And I would assume also in Japan and China, although, you know, you can correct me if, you, if you're familiar with how the Mongols are written about in Japanese and Chinese, correct me on this, but I would imagine they also saw in this way where they only talked about the Mongol Empire. You know, you don't hear anything about Mongolian history except for that period of Genghis Khan and his successors creating the Mongol Empire. As soon as the Mongol Empire goes away, the Mongols disappear from world history as far as most, you know, world history books are concerned, as far as most classes on world history are concerned. And so what gets emphasized about the Mongols and about Genghis Khan is the conquests. That's what's interesting to a Western audience, to a Chinese audience, to a Russian audience. And so that's the aspect of Genghis Khan that gets all the attention in places like the United States and in Europe. But in Mongolia, the conquests are not of interest. Let me give you a, a, a narrow example of how history is written about, just to give you kind of a, a flavor of what this is like. In Western writing about the Mongols, Kublai Khan is a very important figure. He's the guy who established the Yuan Dynasty in China. He was a Mongol. He was the grandson of Genghis Khan. But he also established the Yuan Dynasty in China he ruled China for a long time. Um, he represented a kind of um, accommodation to Chinese ways of thought because his idea was to uh, bring in Chinese ideas, uh, incorporate a Chinese bureaucracy, incorporate um, Chinese ideas about what it means to be an emperor, what it, you know, what it means to have an imperial dynasty. He took a Chinese imperial dynastic name for his family, the Yan Dynasty. That's the dynasty that ruled China in the Mongol period. He uh, created a new capital city along Chinese lines, according to Chinese principles of urban planning. And his general idea was, if we get the Chinese to accept the Mongols as a legitimate Chinese dynasty, they're more likely to go along with our rule. Now, he was opposed at the beginning of his reign by a brother named Adek Bicha, who had a very different philosophy about how the empire should function. His idea was emphasize traditional Mongol values, don't live in a Chinese imperial palace, live on the Mongolian steppe as their ancestors had done. Don't pay any attention to what the Chinese care about, just be a Mongol and exploit the Chinese, sure, take whatever you want from the Chinese, but don't give up your Mongol way of life, you know, stay on the steppe and stay in Mongolia and be a Mongol. That was his idea. Now, in Western writing, when we write about the Mongol Empire, if you find a book about the Mongol Empire and read about it, uh, if you take a college class about the Mongol Empire, if you watch a documentary about the Mongol Empire, they'll talk about Kublai Khan. He's a really important figure. Uh, he's famous in the West because Marco Polo, when he visited China, Kublai Khan was the leader of China at the time. 
Kublai Khan figures very prominently in the history of the Mongol Empire from a Western perspective. But within Mongolia, Kublai Khan is hardly mentioned. He's a bit player in the history of the Mongols. But Adik Bukha gets a lot more attention because he was the guy who was going to stay in Mongolia and be a Mongolian. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense because the purpose of this modern Mongolian history writing is to talk about the Mongolian nation state. The history of the nation state. You know, you look at the map, the boundaries of Mongolia, that's the subject of interest. The Mongolian Empire is not the subject of interest. What was happening in Mongolia was of, is of interest to modern Mongolians. So Adik Birka is considered part of the mainstream of Mongolian history because he was the guy who was staying in Mongolia. Whereas for Westerners, Kublai Khan is considered the mainstream of Mongolian history because he was part of the continued expansion of the Mongol Empire. And it was the fact that the Mongol Empire was expanding, which is the thing of interest to Westerners. So um, that's, you know, I, I, I use that example as kind of a minor, a small encapsulation of this larger idea, which is that for Mongolians within Mongolia, the parts of Mongol history they care about are not the same as the parts of Mongol history that we care about. And this thing about narrative, the way you can think about it, it's kind of like in US history, we have a core narrative that everyone in the US is supposed to learn in our you know, elementary and high school education, you're supposed to learn certain things about US history. There's this idea that there's this core narrative of US history that everyone's supposed to know. And then there are other aspects of US history that are, you know, kind of interesting. You can know it, it's optional, but it's not part of the core story. And so when you're learning about US history, you learn about uh, westward expansion, you learn about the sectional crisis, which led to the Civil War, you learn about the Gilded Age, the Industrial Revolution, World War I, World War II, the Progressive Movement. Those are all things that are considered part of the core of the U.S. historical narrative. U.S. foreign policy in Latin America is not. So whereas for Latin Americans, they might think U.S. involvement in Latin America is a pretty big deal. Americans tend not to pay any attention. You know, people in the U.S. tend not, not to pay any attention to the involvement the, that the U.S. has had in Latin America. They seem, they're seem they completely unaware of the military uh, interventions that the U.S. has done in Latin America over the years. Because that's not part of the core narrative as far as Americans are concerned. Now, how you construct a core narrative is arbitrary. I mean, it's just a matter of what people decide to do, whether they decide to put some stuff in the core narrative or put it as part of the optional side stuff. And it so happens that Americans have collectively decided that U.S. interventions in Latin America are not part of the core narrative. They're, they're a sideshow. That you, there's an optional thing you can learn about. If you're really into that particular thing, you might learn about it, but you're not going to learn about it in general. And that's what Mongol history is like. There's a core narrative in Mongolian history that you see in the Mongolian books where they emphasize what was going on within Mongolia. And there are certain things in Mongolian history that get a lot of attention, like the introduction of Buddhism and the communist revolution. And, and before that, the 1911 revolution and the struggle for independence, things like that get a lot of attention. But what doesn't get attention is the Mongol conquest. They're considered a sideshow. They're considered an optional extra thing. They're not part of the core narrative that every Mongolian should know. They're an extra thing. And it's always treated as foreign affairs. So they'll, you'll learn about what was going on within Mongolia, and then you'll learn about, you might, if you want, you can also learn about what was going on in foreign affairs in Mongolia in the 1200s, which includes the conquests. But the core events, as far as, Mon as far as Mongolian historiography is concerned, in other words, Mongolian history writing, the way history is written in Mongolia, the core events going on in the 1200s was Chinggis Khan creating the Mongol nation, bringing the tribes together, establishing them as a single nation giving them a body of laws called the Yasag, um, giving them a writing system to give them greater unity. Everything that he was doing was directed toward creating a unity for the Mongolian people, forging a nation, creating the nation state that now exists. 
Um, and, and so that's why Mongolians hold him up as a hero, because they see him as the man who created the Mongol nation, took people who were Mongol, but were disunited, politically disunited, and forged a political union among them to make them a single country. And so this is a good reminder that there is not a single objective version of historical narrative that exists out there to be discovered. Rather, what we do is we take the mass of the millions, literally millions of historical factoids that exist, and we as a society collectively choose certain ones of those as the important ones, the ones to focus on, and say that is what creates the narrative that explains who we are, whoever we is, the nation state, the socioeconomic group, whatever it is, whatever your group is that you're creating a narrative, a historical narrative for to explain, you pick and choose by necessity, because you can't use all of the historical data. You pick and choose certain historical data and you say, those parts are important. They're the ones that show us how we came to be who we are. And it so happens that in Mongolia, the aspects of Genghis Khan that are focused on are the ones that relate to how modern Mongolians think of themselves as a nation state. And the Mongol empire is not relevant to the nation state. It, there's, it doesn't matter to that. Um, and we all do this. And it's easy for us to look at a foreign country, to look at a place like Mongolia and be like, you know, you guys are ignoring a really important thing that happened. <laughs> Uh, it's easy for us to do that. It's harder for us to look at ourselves, to look at the plank in our own eye and be like, wait, are we doing that? Are there things about our own history that we're deliberately ignoring because it doesn't suit our narrative? But the important thing to keep in mind is it's not a matter of picking the one right narrative that is objectively correct. Rather, it's a matter of what decisions are we making? What principles are we going with? What bases are we basing our decisions on by which we decide which historical events and processes we're going to highlight in constructing our narrative? You can't help. A narrative can't help but be constructed. It's impossible for a narrative not to be constructed. Every historical narrative is constructed. Um, it's, it's not a matter of being like, well, they have a constructed narrative, therefore their narrative is wrong. My narrative is correct because it represents actual reality. That's not how it works. Everybody's narrative is constructed. Okay. I hope that made sense. Uh, if you are celebrating Chinggis Khan Day this year, a happy Chinggis Khan Day. If you're offended by Chinggis Khan Day, I apologize for saying happy Chinggis Khan Day. I just really like Mongolian history and this day... Each year in November gives me an excuse to make at least one video a year about it. That's all I'm doing. Uh, thanks for joining me.